Good morning, sir. Can you see and hear us? Yes, I can. Thank you very much. Sir, before we turn to Ms Winter's evidence, could I deal, please, with the witness statement of James McLernan, uh, who is a principal public prosecutor in the High Court and International Section of the Public Prosecution Service in Northern Ireland? For the transcript, his statement can be found at WITN 102-80100. There is no need to bring that up on screen, but I can confirm, sir, that that witness statement has been disclosed to core participants. Mr. McLernan's evidence is relevant predominantly to phase four, uh, but the th final three paragraphs are relevant to phase five of the inquiry. For the purposes of phase four, can I please indicate that paragraphs 1 to 30 are to be treated as read into the inquiry's record, although I do not intend to read the contents of those paragraphs out now. As a result, this evidence may be taken into account by you in due course, even though it has not been subject uh, of oral evidence during phase four. As for the remaining paragraphs in Mr. McLernan's witness statement, namely paragraphs 31 to 33, these will either be the subject of oral evidence or read into the record in phase five. I should also confirm that this witness statement will be published in its entirety on the inquiry's website after today's hearing. Thank you very much. May we proceed then please to call Ms Winter? Yes, of course. As you know, sir, Ms. Winter appears remotely following your grant of permission for her to do so. Yeah. Good morning. Can you hear and see me, Ms. Winter? Yes, I can. Okay. I understand that you wish to swear in the Bible. Yes, that's right. Do you have a Bible with you? I have. Okay. Uh, if you'd like to repeat after me, I swear by Almighty God... I swear by Almighty God that the evidence I shall give that the evidence I shall give shall be the truth shall be the truth the whole truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth and nothing but the truth thank you good morning miss winter thank you for appearing this morning to assist the inquiry in its work as you know i will be asking you questions on behalf of the inquiry you should have a hard copy of a witness statement in your name, dated the 2nd of January 2024, in front of you. Do you have that? Yes, I have. Could you turn, please, to page 40 of that statement? Yes. Do you have a copy with a visible signature? I have. Is that your signature? It is. Are the contents of your statement true to the best of your knowledge and belief? They are. For the purposes of the transcript, the reference for Ms. Winter's statement is WITN 104-001-00. Ms. Winter, I will not be asking you about every aspect of the witness statement you have provided, which will be published on the inquiry website in due course. I will instead be asking you about certain specific issues which are addressed in it. That's right, that's okay. Starting, please, with the roles you have held with the post office. You started work as a counter assistant in a sub post office in Randallstown in Northern Ireland in 1973, is that right? Yes. And in 1976, you gained employment in a Crown Office branch working on the counter. That's right. After two years, you progressed to a secure area role, is that right? Yes. And then you held various roles um, over a period, including an auditor role and a sales manager role, is that right? Yes. Until in around 1997 or 1998, you were successful in applying for a role with the Royal Mail security team as an investigator, is that right? Yes, it would have been maybe just slightly before then, but yes. <clears throat> You say slightly before. In your statement, you said 1997 or 98. Do you think it was a little earlier? That's right. No, you're right. Is it right that that role involved detecting external offences against Royal Mail 
rather than investigating suspected offences committed internally by Royal Mail agents or employees? Yes, it was Royal Mail and it was investigating theft in the post or birthday cards. You then moved in 2001 after a business reorganisation to Post Office Limited based in Belfast as an investigations manager in the Post Office security team, is that right? Yes. And at that stage, is it right that your role was limited to investigations of internal suspected offences against the post office? Yes. But after a further reorganisation of the business, your role expanded also to cover physical security, robberies, burglaries and the like. Is that right? That's right. You do not provide a date for this change in, to your role in the statement. We have heard from another witness that the expansion of the investigator role to include physical security occurred as a result of a reorganisation which took place in around 2011. Does that sound about right to you or not? That, that would have been about right, yes. Is it right that you remained in the investigation team and, until you left the post office? in December 2014, having taken voluntary redundancy? Yes. Were you based in Northern Ireland for the whole of your career with the post office? I was. I would like to turn, please, to your investigator training. Should we take it from the career history set out in your statement that you did not have any experience of criminal investigation or criminal law when you first became a Royal Mail investigator? That's right. In terms of the initial training that you had when you became a Royal Mail investigator, you say at paragraph eight of your statement that you were given three weeks of training in the Royal Mail Training School in Milton Keynes. Is that right? That's right. Which you say covered all aspects of the role, including witness statement taking, analysing data, interviewing suspects, pace, risk assessments and surveillance. When you refer to analysing data, what kind of data do you mean? And think, bearing in mind this is the initial training in 97 or 98. With Royal Mail investigation, um, you would be analysing um, data of lost mail, um, customers that have reported uh, losing mail, um, during the course of its, uh, in the Royal Mail Centre, you would be looking at um, access records, who has access to mail, absence records, um, and you would be following from the time that the letter or the item was posted till it disappeared. You also received training when you moved to become an investigator with the post office in 2001, didn't you? Yes. And you say at paragraph nine of your statement that training was at the training college in Milton Keynes and also lasted three weeks. Yes. In addition to the topics you identified from your Royal Mail training, you say in your statement that the training in 2001 covered working on the horizon system. Yes. Can you help with what the training on working on the horizon system consisted of, please? Um, I remember getting horizon training whenever we were on the training course and also whenever I came back to Belfast. Um, I sat in, my office was beside the training school and I arranged for me to sit in whenever sub-postmasters were being trained, for me to sit in with the school and be trained as well. So your training was on using the Horizon system, is that right? Yes. As opposed to analysing any data from that system? That's right. You refer at paragraph 9 of your statement to the, two, to the 2001 training including data analysis. What sort of data were you trained to analyse on that initial three-week training? 
On the initial three-week training, that was really actually maybe using the system. I did more analytic work whenever I came back to Belfast and in the training school. And that's whenever I did some more of analysis because I was with the trainers and they would answer my queries or ex uh, explain to me how to read the data that you're getting from the system. What were you taught to look for in the data? Um, in the data, you would look for whenever cash declarations are made. Um, you would look for user IDs. Um, you would look for the transactions that the customers have said had taken place. And you would be taught on the different codes within the Horizon system. What was the purpose of the data analysis you were being taught about? Really, it was to learn how the system worked and, for instance, how one transaction can be different and shown differently on the computer system as another transaction. Um, you could see how branch trading statements were done at the end of the uh, accounting week. Were you taught how to look in Horizon data for errors made by the system? No. Were you trained on the audit data which was available on request from Fujitsu over and above the data which was available to be printed from a counter in branch? You could read it to a certain extent. Um, you, did you mean the ARQ? The, da the data? Yes. Um, I'm asking though in terms of your training whether you were trained on that audit data, the ARQ request data from Fujitsu? Not on that training. Were you trained later on that? Later, as you worked within the office and worked with Horizon, you, um, you came aware of uh, some data that would be on it, but in no way would I be an expert on it. Were you given any guidance at your initial training in 2001 on the circumstances in which audit data should be requested from Fujitsu? In that initial training, no. Uh, you were not told how to get any information from Fujitsu because you were told that the system was 100% reliable. And who told you that, that the system was 100% reliable? Whenever you were at the training college, You've referred in your statement to being told on initial training that the system was completely reliable. So focusing for now in, on two th in 2001, who was delivering that message then? That would have been the training school in Milton Keynes. And were these Royal Mail trainers? Post office. Post office trainers. Was there anyone from Fujitsu at that initial training delivering that message? No. When you had your training on the Horizon system, was there anyone from Fujitsu delivering that message that Horizon was completely reliable? No. Another topic you list as having been covered in 2001 was full disclosure. Did the training on this include you being told where you were the lead investigator in a case, you would also usually be the disclosure officer in the case? Yes. Were you made aware that this was a distinct role held over and above your role as an investigator which carried with it distinct duties? Yes. Do you recall being told what those distinct duties on a disclosure officer were? Yes. Do you recall being told about the duties and responsibilities on investigators and disclosure officers under the Criminal Procedure and Investigations Act 1996 and its associated codes of practice? Yes. 
do you recall being told about the duty on all investigators to pursue all reasonable lines of investigation, whether they led to Woods or away from the guilt of the suspect? Yes, I do recall. Do you recall, recall being told about the duty to record, retain and review all material collected or generated during an investigation so that it could be considered for disclosure? Yes. Do you recall being told of the need to draw any unused material capable of undermining the prosecution case or assisting the defence case to the attention of the reviewing lawyer? Yes, I do. Were you made aware that the duty to follow lines of inquiry led away, which led away as well as towards the guilt of a suspect, extended to material in the hands of a third party, for example, Fujitsu? Sorry, could you repeat that question again? Of course. So the duty to follow lines of inquiry, which led away from as well as towards the guilt of a suspect, were you told that that duty extended to material in the hands of a third party, for example, Fujitsu? Yes. Was any part of the training delivered in 2001 delivered by lawyers as opposed to post office trainers? In 2001, yes, there was training in Milton Keynes by lawyers. Which aspects of the training were delivered by lawyers? It was post office lawyers and it was with regard to uh, committal papers going to court and um, attending court uh, and the legal side of the system. And was that the criminal law team from, from Royal Mail? It was. You travelled to Milton Keynes for your Royal Mail and Post Office investigator training. Did this training cover the criminal law or procedure in Northern Ireland at all? I would have to say not really. Is it right that you attended search training, both when you became an investigator with Royal Mail and when you became a post office investigator in 2001? Yes, I did. And that was provided by Thames Valley Police on both occasions? Yes, it was. What were you told on that training about the basis for the post office conducting searches as part of their investigations? Um, for conducting a search, um, you needed to have um, sufficient people doing the search. Um, you had a note taker, you had the person, it was maybe two people doing the search. Um, so after an incident in 2000, where one of the post office investigators was shot and killed, we had to have an additional person during the search for health and safety. In terms of the basis for conducting searches though, what were you told about the grounds on which the post office could search premises, for example? You could only search premises with the person's permission. It was a voluntary search, the same as for a vehicle. Is it right that after your training in 2001, you were mentored by, uh, you refer to him as Les Thorpe, for six months, and he was your line manager? Yes, that's right. Did he give you any guidance on lines of inquiry or disclosure while he was mentoring you? Yes, he did. And what did he tell you? Um, he had been an investigator, I think, for some time, and Les would have uh, mentored me to ensure that you completed the relevant documents that you were putting forward all evidence that you had and that um, the different inquiries that you possibly had to make to make sure you had done the job as best you could. At paragraph 27 of your statement, you refer to there being subsequent workshops and refresher training after your initial training. 
when there were significant changes to legislation or working arrangements within the casework team. How often did workshops or refresher training take place? Can you recall? I don't recall a lot of workshops, um, refresher training. Um, you're maybe talking maybe once every six months or I don't recall a lot of it. It would be if there was some changes perhaps within the, the policies. Do you recall who provided this training? The training was usually done by possibly senior managers whenever you went to a workshop. Can you recall an example of a significant change to legislation that prompted a workshop or refresher training? I'm sorry, I can't recall. Was there any Northern Irish specific training given to you as an investigator by the post office? No. Turning please to policy and guidance, how would you access Northern Irish legislation or codes of practice if you needed to refer to them? I would have um, liaised with the police. Could we have paragraph 15 of Ms Winter's statement on screen, please? It is page 11 of WITN 1040100. It's page 11, please. And scrolling down, please, to paragraph 15. You say here, any legislation, policies or guidance governing the conduct of investigations conducted by the security team during my period of working within that team, if relevant, would have been communicated usually by policy and standards or the casework team. From my recollection, a different caution was issued in Northern Ireland and the police and criminal codes of practice in Northern Ireland were followed rather than their England and Wales equivalent. The correct routines for Northern Ireland were applied. Different Northern Ireland specific forms would also be used when conducting a formal interview. Was this communication of legislation, policy or guidance communication of new or amended legislation, policy or guidance? This, this um, was um, our guidance for Northern Ireland. Whenever I went to the training college, they would have been uh, training everyone on um, England and Wales. And then usually as an afterthought, they would have said, oh, by the way, it's a different <laughs> in Northern Ireland. Um, you have to use different forms in Northern Ireland. So my job was always to make sure that those correct forms were used. What was the method of communication by policy and standards or the casework team? With the policy and standards, they would have issued new policies. And again, it most likely would have had on, above it, this is, applies to England and Wales. And then usually at the bottom paragraph, it would maybe say, um, for Scottish law, there would be one line, and for Northern Ireland law, another line. Um, so sometimes, usually, you had to go and uh, look in policy and standards where you could get it on the computer, uh, policy and standards. Um, but I usually always check, again, with the police. In a more practical sense, how were these documents sent to you? <coughs> or were they simply on and on the system? They would be sent to you um, as the policies changed and maybe would be discussed depending on what the policy was whenever you were having um, a team meeting. Um, but then you were told they would be on the, um, on the computer where you could go into the programme and look at the new policies. Was that something that all investigators had access to? Yes. 
Taking an example of a policy document covering investigation procedures specific to Northern Ireland, could we have on screen, please, POL 000 This document is dated November 2002 and appears to be an appendix to an investigation policy applicable to investigations in Northern Ireland. The title is Notes of Interview, Northern Ireland. Did you recognise this document when it was sent to you by the inquiry? I do recognise that document. Is that the sort of document which would be sent to you by policy and standards or casework? Um, yes. Could we have on screen, please, paragraph 28 of Ms. Winter's statement? It is page 17 of that statement. At paragraph 28, you say this, to assist with Northern Ireland law, I would have taken advice from PSNI, is that Police, Police Service Northern Ireland? Yes. Or PPS, is that Public Prosecution Service? That's right. There would be circumstances where information would be sought from third parties who might hold relevant evidence where shortfalls were identified in branch, e.g. the paid order unit. In Northern Ireland, the various departments were relatively small and we maintained close contact. First of all, when you refer to the various departments, do you mean the PSNI and the PPS? Yes, that would be for the Northern, Northern Ireland law. So the various departments that were relatively small and you maintained close contact with, that was departments within the PSNI and the PPS? Yes, that's right. How small were the departments you were dealing with? The PSNI would have been the fraud branch in Belfast um, and the PPS was the Crown Prosecution Office in Belfast. In terms of the size of your own team, you say at paragraph nine of your statement that although you had the grade of a manager, you did not have anyone working to you, so you were effectively a one-person department. Was it the case that throughout the time you were a post office investigator in Northern Ireland, you were a one-person department, or did that change? No, it was always a one-person department. You didn't have staff. Um, it was just a title. Should we take it from this that, and this paragraph here, 28, that any specific guidance you needed on Northern Irish law or procedure came from the police service, Northern Ireland, or the public prosecution service, rather than the post office? Mainly from the police and from the Crown Prosecution Service. There was um, a few cases where I was maybe involved in England and that would have come underneath the post office uh, criminal law team. The reference here to third parties who might hold relevant evidence. You give an example of the paid order unit. What was that? The paid order unit was a unit in Lissa Halley in uh, Derry, London Derry and it's where paid pension foils were sent from all the post offices and they were accumulated in the paid order unit in Lissahalley. 
you don't list there Fujitsu as a third party who might hold relevant evidence where shortfalls were identified. Is that because Fujitsu did not spring to mind as someone you would approach in, that, in those circumstances? Not in those circumstances, and I never had direct contact with Fujitsu, whereas the likes of the paid order unit, I had direct contact. I'd like to turn, please, to your role as an investigator. Could we go to page five of this statement, please? Towards the bottom of the page, paragraph 11. And about three lines down, you say, as an investigator, my role was to interview post office employees and agents who were suspected of or had admitted to committing a criminal offence and to ascertain the facts in the inquiry. You deal with an investigator's involvement when a branch was being audited at paragraph 20 of your statement. That's page 13, please. And four lines up from the bottom there, you say the investigator's role on attendance would be to introduce themselves, their second officer and the audit team. They would explain why they were visiting the office, issue a caution, advise the person of their legal rights and post office friend rule, make a notebook entry recording that. The investigator would remain on site and await the final outcome of the audit and report to the contracts manager and to the line manager. If there was no reasonable explanation for a loss identified, the investigator would remind the person they were still under caution and invite them for a formal interview. In terms of how a suspicion of the commission of a criminal offence was established so as to prompt formal interview, was it the case that anyone experiencing an unexplained shortfall in a branch was considered a suspect? No. So that's not what you mean when you say, when there was no reasonable explanation for a loss identified, the investigator would remind the person they were still under caution and invite them for a formal interview. Yet not everyone would be asked, it would not be everyone that you would ask to send for uh, an interview. But it if would be the outcome of the audit. But if there was an apparent shortfall <clears throat> and it was unexplained in the sense that no reasonable explanation had been given, it seems to be your evidence here that that prompts suspicion yes. that prompts a formal interview. Is that right? That would prompt, and the, the um, interview is voluntary. You have said in your evidence this morning that you were aware of the obligation on an investigator to pursue lines of inquiry, pointing away from, as well as towards, the guilt of a suspect. Did you ever consider that that obligation required you to get to the bottom of a shortfall or an apparent shortfall? In other words, to pinpoint the point at which loss occurred and to demonstrate an actual loss? Yes. Did you always do that? Try to get to the bottom of a shortfall and pinpoint an actual loss? Yes, I ab absolutely did. So as far as you're concerned, in all your cases, you established an actual loss. Is that what you're telling us? No, we're not establish an actual loss. I would have done my best, to the best of my ability, to establish where this loss happened and how it happened, and to explain where, where it had gone. Could we have on screen, please, POL 
this document is the individualised objectives for security team members for 2013 to 2014. The objectives for you are set out at page, pages 136 to 139. Could we have page 136 on screen first, please? We can see here your name and the first two box boxes on this page refer to core behaviours. And then over the page to 137, please. This objective is set out to ensure a robust approach to fraud loss recovery with a return rate of 65%. Activity to include ensure that evidence opportunities are maximised through stakeholder engagement, technical elements of inquiries are effectively deployed, and in square brackets, searches of persons' premises. Second, ensuring full engagement with FIs. Is that financial investigators? Yes. And police contacts, <coughs> optimising POCA powers and to achieve maximum possible recovery, e.g. monetary recovery, asset recognition. And then third, ensure all intervention measures are adopted to recover stolen funds. Is it right that as an investigator, you were set a target for the recovery of monies from those who were being investigated? Yes, that 65% rate was for fraud loss recovery. Um, the senior team in the security were always uh, trying to get as much money back as they possibly could. 65% was for fraud loss. Whenever, um, just to explain, whenever an investigation starts, there's two, it's two pronged. You have the criminal investigation, which I would have investigated in Northern Ireland, and then you would have had the contracts team. Now, with the criminal investigation, I would have performed my um, duties to look into all the loss, uh, conduct the inquiry, and you are always asking. We were told every time you interview someone, you had to ask them, could they repay the money? If at that stage the criminal investigation is not going any further, that is closed down. But the contracts team, they remain continuing and they will ask for the money back. So you will have a situation where I've investigated a case, but it hasn't gone for prosecution, but it's the contracts team that are asking for the money back. The target was by this point 65%. Had there been a different lower target in earlier years, do you recall? Yes, I do believe there was. And it was maybe the last three, four years, there was more pressure put on everyone by um, the senior team uh, to increase this figure. Do you call, recall the reason for the increase? I don't think they gave a particular reason to us um, as, a, as a security team. Um, we just felt there was more pressure put on you. Um, you have to understand also that all of these objectives, that 65% was just a small part of what you had to achieve. You were targeted in everything that you did. You were marked on everything that you did. And you were um, spoken with at the end of every month if you were not meeting the standards that they required. Did those standards include there being a certain number of investigations or level of investigations that you were pursuing? No, because you couldn't, um, it just depended on the information that you got or investigations in Northern Ireland. Um, you could maybe just have two investigations going 
or you might have five investigations going. That would, you had no control over that, over that figure. You didn't have any control over that. Was your, I'm sorry, sorry. I, please go ahead. I could be investigating a case and it's not criminal. I feel there's no information there. There isn't sufficient information to say it was any criminal activity. Um, so then that would go straight back to the contracts team and they would then be involved. I would have no involvement. They were completely two different areas, contracts and invest criminal investigations. Was your performance measured, at least in part, against your recovery target, and here that being 65%? Yes. What happened if you didn't meet that target? You, um, you, you just didn't meet that target. You would maybe be trying to increase your figures on other parts of the objectives, where you are being proactive in um, uh, educating people on having good security within their post office and making sure they have all their procedures in place. Was meeting this target rewarded in any way by the post office? I don't think it was. You were given a mark. It was like an appraisal mark. And depending on how well you had done in these objectives, you were marked from um, from one up to five. Was this a target which was set for all post office investigators? Yes, I believe I believe it was. I would not have seen those objectives that you're showing on the screen were my own personal objectives. Um, and once you were given them, then they would most likely put on the computer as you've done here today. And we could see then everybody else's, but I mean, I didn't go looking to see oh, what is everybody else doing? I was just concerned with what I had been targeted to. Do you think that this target ever influenced the conduct of investigations you were charged with? No. Looking please to the first bullet point in that box, what did it mean in practice to maximise evidence opportunities? You ensured that any evidence that you had that was available that you had been sure to go down that road of um, every inquiry to make sure all the stakeholders, you'd spoken to the stakeholders, you knew what was involved and that you hadn't left really any stone unturned. Thank you. That document can come down now, please. Being a one-person department, what supervision was there over your cases? I would have had daily contact with, uh, originally it was Les Thorpe with my manager. Um, you, you ensured that you spoke with each other at least every couple of days. And then you had one-to-one -one meetings every month. My line manager would have flown over to Belfast and we would have had one-to-one -one meetings. Then you would have had a team meeting. Team meetings again would have most likely been once a month where I would have flown over to um, London or Manchester or Glasgow. Did you discuss the issues which arose in your cases with other investigators in other parts of the United Kingdom? No. Do you think you would have benefited from the opportunity to be able to do so? I do. Turning please to the process for criminal investigation and prosecution of post office agents, their staff and post office employees in Northern Ireland. Could we have on screen please paragraph 23 of Ms Winter's statement, that is page 15.
You say here at paragraph 23, following an investigation in Northern Ireland, a suspect offender file would be prepared and forwarded to head of security for any recommendations. They would review the information available and make any decisions. The decision would be communicated to the casework manager and the file would be, then be returned to me. Pausing there, so is it right that before a case would be put forward to the prosecution decision maker, the head of security had to sign off on that course? Yes. In Northern Ireland, was there any input into the decision on whether to refer a case to the prosecution decision maker from the Royal Mail or later Post Office criminal law team? No. And, and when you say head of security, just so that I'm clear, do you mean by that the head of the security team for the UK, or do you mean someone in Northern Ireland? It would have been the head of security for the UK, I remember. Right, thank you. Could we have on screen, please, paragraph 39 of Ms. Winter's statement? That is page 21. And at paragraph 39, you say this. When I joined the post office security team, there was no internal prosecution process in place as Northern Ireland has its own courts and system. As I had worked in Royal Mail security previously and cases were handed to the police, a similar process was put in place for post office investigations. I worked with post office security team, post office legal team, PSNI, that's Police Service uh, Northern Ireland, and the Public Prosecution Office to develop and agree a memorandum of understanding on how to progress suspect offender files through the courts. The work you refer to here to put in place a memorandum of understanding, was that done in 2001 when you first joined the post office security team? Yes. You refer here to the Public Prosecution Office. It is the inquiry's understanding that in 2001, criminal cases were prosecuted by the Department of the Director of Public Prosecutions, the Public Prosecution Service having been established later in around 2005. Does that accord with your understanding? Yes, that would be right. So is your reference here to the Public Prosecutions Office a reference to the Department of the Director of Public Prosecutions in 2001? Yes. Can you help with how cases which were investigated by the post office in Northern Ireland were progressed to the DPP before you helped to put in place the process you have outlined here? There was no process in place whenever I took the post of an investigator in Northern Ireland for prosecutions. Who from the post office legal team did you work with on the development of a memorandum of understanding? I didn't work with anyone of the post office legal team. Well, you say here, I worked with the post office security team, post office legal team, PSNI and the public prosecution office to develop and agree a memorandum of understanding. So I'm asking who from the post office legal team you worked with to do that. I wouldn't have actually worked with them. They would have been involved, whenever I say worked with, they would have been involved in my taking part in the, agreeing the memorandum of understanding, um, really just to let them know what was happening. They would not have given advice because it was for Northern Ireland law, but it was to keep them posted and they were involved in what I was doing because I just couldn't go uh, and do whatever I wanted. I need to let them know I was involved in this process. I see. The inquiry has been unable to locate a copy of any written memorandum of understanding dating to the time you joined the post office security team. Can you help with whether this mem memorandum of understanding was formally committed to a written agreement 
or whether it was instead agreed more informally? It had to be a written agreement because it was stated down how the file would be progressed. And before that written agreement was made, there was meetings with the police, um, with the director of public prosecutions, and with a senior manager from the post office and myself. And then the memorandum of understanding was signed off by the chief superintendent and a copy was kept in Belfast of that memorandum. In terms of what was agreed and the process which was put in place, you deal with this at paragraph 41, which is on towards the bottom of this page of the statement. But you have also provided a slightly more detailed account at paragraph 23 of the statement, and I'd like to look at that, please. Could we have page 15? And we looked at the start of this paragraph earlier, picking up from five lines down. Once the casework manager authorised progression of the file, I produced an evidential report and handed it to the PSNI. The PSNI would consider the material and discuss the report with me, if any additional material would be required, and how to set out and produce a prosecution file for progression to the public prosecution service. This was the process put in place by me after I joined the security team. So this process required you to send an evidential report to the PSNI, is that right? Yes. Then they would consider it and discuss with you any additional material required? Yes. Did the investigation remain a post office investigation even after an evidential report had been sent to the police? Once I had handed it into the police, the police then allocated the case to a police officer. And then the police officer would have liaised with myself uh, regarding any further information. But in terms of ownership, did that become a police investigation or did it remain an, a post office investigation? In a way, we, we both dealt with it. The police, um, if they would have interviewed the person involved as well, they then took on as a police case. <laughs> they needed information or additional disclosure of what they wanted. They would have come back to me and asked for it. Was this therefore the police advising the post office on what steps they needed to take for the case to be ready for presentation to the prosecution decision maker? Yes, the police looked through the file and if they felt there was more um, information needed or they guided me on how I should word certain documents and how I should present the file so as it was um, easily read by the Public Prosecution Service. You've referred to the police asking for additional material. Did the PSNI ever recommend that you follow further lines of inquiry? Yes, they did. Can you recall what type of further inquiries the PSNI recommended you make? With regard to, for instance, we mentioned the paid order unit in Lissahalley. Um, they advised me with cases involving um, the people, you need statements from every person for continuity of evidence. You need to go to the beginning of the evidence and follow it through with your statements. So sometimes there was quite a lot of statements you needed to take from the paid order unit. Um, with regard to Fujitsu, um, they always asked for a statement from Fujitsu to say that the horizon was completely reliable, as what we had always been told. We'll come on to liaison with Fujitsu in Northern Ireland in due course. 
But in the case of a horizon system, if the, in a case where the horizon system was showing a shortfall in a branch, do you recall the PSNI ever saying that further evidence or inquiries needed to be made to evidence an actual loss suffered by the post office? I can't recall because you're trying to have all the evidence that you feel the, the police will need. Um, but the police um, always asked for a statement. Because we were dealing with a computer, the police always said you need to have a statement to say that this computer is working correctly and reliable. I have to say, whenever I first put my first prosecution and I requested this statement from Fujitsu, you have to go through the casework team. And I can recall, I feel, that they didn't have such a statement and it took me some time to get the statement through to say that um, Fujitsu were prepared to put all the information onto a statement. Should we take the reference here to the Public Prosecution Service to be a reference to the DPP for the period pre the establishment of the PPS? Yes. Who would produce the report for the DPP and later the PPS? You or the PSNI? The PSNI would have looked at the information I had given and that would go to the DPP as well as a report from the police because um, I am just putting forward the information. The police then look at that information and then they put it forward to the Public Prosecution Service and it is the Public Prosecution Service or the DPP that authorised any prosecutions. You say in the next line in this paragraph, after where we left off, after security team, that this process developed and changed over the years. Before we come on to the example you give here of a change to the process, I'd like to ask you please about a report of the Chief Inspector of Criminal Justice in Northern Ireland from July 2008. Could we have this up on screen, please? The reference is POL 0012167. The quality of the front page is not terribly good, but if we, if we turn to page two of this document, we can see the title more clearly. The title is Royal Mail Group, an inspection of the Royal Mail Group crime investigations function. It is dated July 2008. Turning over the page, please. And there's a blank page there, so one more page, please. Apologies, if we can go to page six. We have here the Chief Inspector's foreword. And scrolling down, please. This is signed by Kit Chiver. Uh, the Chief Inspector of Criminal Justice in Northern Ireland. There is a logo towards the bottom <coughs> of the page, Criminal Justice Inspection Northern Ireland, a better justice system for all. Can you help with what, the, what body this logo is referring to? No. Does it follow that you can't assist with what its function was? Well, the, the criminal justice system was um, 
an independent expectorate in Northern Ireland of the justice system and to ensure that all standards are um, 100%. And how does the chief inspector who wrote the foreword fit in with that? Well, in Northern Ireland, um, anything involved with the criminal system, they're always audited. And I think it was our time in Royal Mail, and it was Royal Mail in Belfast. I remember the um, inspection, and it was Royal Mail investigators, um, post office limited investigators, and we had to produce all our case files and any information that the auditor wished to see to ensure that we were uh, meeting all the criteria that is needed to involve uh, criminal cases. Could we look please to page 15 of this document? Paragraph 1.10 says this, RMG conducts its own English and Welsh prosecutions according to the Code for Crown Prosecutors. In Scotland, completed investigation files are forwarded to the Procurator Fiscal's Office, and in NI, complete investigation files are forwarded via the PSNI to the Public Prosecution Service. At the time of inspection, field work consultation with the PPS to enable RMG case files to be submitted directly to them was underway a direct submission process would reduce the potential for delay in processing files. Do you recall there being a consultation with the PPS about direct submission of cases by the relevant investigation function within the more Royal Mail Group and the PPS? Yes. Going then to page 25 of this document, which deals specifically with post office investigations. At paragraph 4.6, please. This says, typical cases dealt with by RML investigators. Is that Royal Mail letters? Yes. Included theft of post and criminal damage. The poll investigator typically dealt with offences committed by PO employees against customer accounts. These investigations had been more complex in nature and had often involved elements of fraudulent behaviour or false accounting. Because the offences had been committed in Northern Ireland and were subject to different submission processes and legislation, the RMG criminal law team had been unable to either provide advice nor decide on prosecution regarding these cases. The poll investigator had access to advice regarding employment legislation if required. For PO criminal cases in Northern Ireland, the internal prosecution decision rests with the head of security. Files had then been forwarded to the PSNI for onward transmission to the PPS. As previously raised in the report, this is an overly complex submission system, which increases the risk of delay. It would be helpful if cases submitted in NI by the poll investigator went through the same less complex process as recommended for Royal Mail cases. And then in bold, inspectors recommend that to improve efficiency and reduce the risk of delay, that post office limited cases are submitted by a more direct method as recommended for RML cases. So we can see a recommendation was being made specifically for post office investigations that cases should be submitted more directly to the PPS. Was this recommendation implemented following this report in July 2008? Yes, yes it was. So this is a change to the process you set out in your statement. Can you recall when it changed and how? I think it took some time to bring in the changes. And um, we then got a local solicitor in Belfast um, who then took my cases instead of them going directly to the police. My cases were then given to this solicitor in Belfast who then uh, directed me 
and what if we needed any extra evidence or if the file was correctly prepared and then it went from the solicitor to the PPS or the DPP. Is that the example that you give in your witness statement of a change to the process? I think so. There was also a change within the police around the same time where um, there was a major change in the police service in Northern Ireland and it meant that it was best for me to just go to a solicitor rather than get access into the police. The next paragraph of the report, paragraph 4.7, says this. There was only one poll investigator for Northern Ireland, but at the time of field work, two other, investiga two other investigators based in England and Scotland were being trained to deal with Northern Ireland cases to improve resilience and to provide support. Inspectors found that there was capacity within the existing RM investigators in Northern Ireland to provide support and cover. There had been cases when the poll investigator had assisted with RML investigations, and this had been reciprocated informally. And then in bold, the recommendation to improve resilience and support, inspectors recommend that RMG Security formalises a flexible approach to investigations so that local investigative staff can be shared across its business areas in Northern Ireland in response to demand. Were you the one post office investigator being referred to here? Yes. How long had that been the case? <clears throat> How... How long had I been the one post office investigator? So you'd referred to yourself as being a one-person department before. We know you had input from your line manager, Mr Thorpe, mm -hmm. but is it right that you were not only a one-person department, but you were the only investigator in Northern Ireland for post office cases? Yes, I was the only person that investigated. There was another person that looked after the physical side, the physical security side, which would have been robberies, burglaries, and then whenever they left, there was literally just me, uh, and I did all of the uh, security work. And then a few years before I left, an additional person was brought in to deal with the physical side, but I was the main investigator. And at the point in time when Mr Thorpe was your line manager, where was he based? I think Mr. Th well, he was based in England. I'm not sure of whereabouts, but it was in England. How many cases were you dealing with at any one time on average? It's difficult to say on average. Um, it just it just depended how the work came in. Sometimes you may have had just five cases, another time you could have had 12 cases. It just depended on what was actually happening. Until the point where an additional person was provided, did you feel adequately supported in your role, being the only investigator? Yes, I did, because Northern Ireland to help you understand, Northern Ireland was completely different to the way everything worked in England. In Northern Ireland, everybody that's involved that I would speak to requiring information regarding a criminal investigation, I worked with on a daily basis. I had face-to-face -face contact with them. So, um, I felt I had all the information right beside me on hand without maybe having to go looking for any information. I worked in the same office as the audit team, the contracts manager, the retail line manager. Um, I had contact with the cash remittance department. Um, put raw in the letters was down the corridor. So it was a totally different setup as what was in England. Sir, I've reached the end of a topic. Would that be a convenient moment for the morning break? Certainly, yeah. <clears throat> so what time shall we resume?
It's 22 now. If we could come back at 5-2, please, sir. Certainly. Thank you. Hello, sir. Can you see and hear us? Yes, thank you. Yes. <laughs> I'd like to move, please, Ms Winter, to the circumstances in which audit data was requested from Fujitsu. Could we have on screen, please, paragraph 34 of Ms Winter's statement? It is page 19. Page 19, please. Do you say it, paragraph 34, scrolling down a bit, please? <clears throat> when I held the position of investigator fraud manager within the security team and any SP, SPM, SPM's managers, assistants, Crown Office employees, attributed any discrepancy to the Horizon system, I would have asked them to give details of the problems and if the matter had been reported to the help desk or their area manager. The matter would be raised with my line manager and casework manager and a decision would be made to request Horizon data to be reviewed for the period in question. From my recall, Horizon transactions could be viewed on credence but only a few months. An ARQ needed to be authorised if you needed to view further back than this. Pausing there, you pick up the question of when ARQ data was requested in the following paragraph over the page. That's paragraph 35. And here you say this, I cannot recall for definite if an ARQ data was requested every time an S a subpostmaster was attributing a shortfall to problems with Horizon. Horizon transactions could be viewed on credence. If a case was going to progress for prosecution, an ARQ was requested. There was only a certain number allowed to be requested each month from Fujitsu, and you might have to wait until the following month. Whose decision was it whether or not to request ARQ data, the investigators or that of their line manager or casework team? I think it would have been more the casework team um, or the line manager, but usually everything went through the casework team. So are you saying it was not the investigator's decision to make? I would request it quite often. I would have requested information. Um, just to explain a little bit, at the start of my time as an investigator, I don't think there was certain information available from Fujitsu or I wasn't aware of it. And then I realised there was a um, credence and credence would be I could go onto my computer and look and see what any particular post office in the United Kingdom was doing or working at. But if you wanted to use any information on credence, you needed an ARQ for um, a witness statement or for court. You couldn't use information from credence. Um, so if I wanted to use credence, I could just go on that myself. But if you want an ARQ, you had to go through casework. You didn't, do, uh, you didn't deal directly with Fujitsu, and we were only allowed a certain amount of ARQs every month. 
Are you saying in your evidence at paragraphs 34 and 35, the parts we've just looked at, that ARQ data was not sought in every case where someone being investigated was attributing a discrepancy to the Horizon system? No, the ARQ would have been requested. You may have had to wait till the following month, but if um, it was going to be um, an actual investigation, you would want the ARQ information. Well, you've said at paragraph 35 here, I cannot recall for definite if an ARQ data was requested every time a, a sub-postmaster was attributing a shortfall to problems with Horizon. So are you yeah. now saying that you can recall? With my cases, my own cases, I cannot remember or recall, but that is what you would want to do. Because you'd want to obtain the best data you could get, wouldn't you, for each and every one of those cases, if someone was attributing a shortfall to problems with Horizon? Absolutely. You referred in your statement to there only being a certain number of allowed requests from Fujitsu per, per month, and you've just touched on that now. Did you mean by that there were only a certain number of allowed requests for which post office was not charged? I, I'm not sure. I don't know about the charges. Um, we were just told you can have only a certain amount of requests in the month. If they had reached that peak, then you would have to wait possibly the next month. But quite often you are always pushing because it delayed your case. Were you ever told you couldn't have it as opposed to needing to wait until the next month because of the cap or limit on the numbers of requests allowed? No, I was never told I couldn't have it. You may have had to wait, but again, I would have been pushing because I would have had perhaps the police pushing me or the public prosecution office pushing me. So you did your best and quite often they were good and maybe exceeded and said, right, I'll get that for you. Um, but on the odd occasion, you would have had to wait if you had reached that, that limit for the month. And are you referring now to what happened once a decision had been made that the case was going to progress for prosecution? You've just referred to requests from the police and the PPS. I'd have I would have requested ARQs even before it went to prosecution, but if it had now reached the police or the PPS and they had decided we need some more information, then I would have requested it then, and that's whenever you could have had a push. But if I was doing an investigation before it even got to the police, I want to satisfy myself exactly what had been happening on the system. I would request an ARQ before it even got to the police stage. Could we have on screen, please, paragraph 29 of this statement? It's page 17. You say here, with regard to Fujitsu, I cannot recall if data would be requested in all cases of cash shortfalls, as we had been assured by Fujitsu that the Horizon system was completely reliable. These assurances were given from senior managers at meetings and during Horizon training. The Horizon training we covered earlier, and uh, my question to you then was whether anyone from Fujitsu was sending that message. Um, but just to be clear, the Horizon training you're talking about here, is that that initial Horizon training or was that a message that was repeated at future training sessions you attended? It was a message that was repeated constantly. And how was that message repeated constantly? If you were over at conference or perhaps where there was large team meetings, 
um, senior managers would have been saying about maybe something about Fujitsu and how the system would be reliable. Whenever you went um, with the, even the Horizon trainers would have been told the system is 100% reliable. Which, but, sorry, um, the post office emphasised, I'm just, it's, as you start to talk about something, you start to recall, um, the post office always emphasised Fujitsu said that the system was reliable. Which senior managers gave you assurances that the Horizon system was completely reliable? I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't put names, but it would have been executive, if it would have been higher up whenever you were at conference, um, they would have had maybe um, security, the head of security on speaking um, and maybe other executives. And that this is where it would come from. It would come from upper level. Can you remember who any of those other executives were? I would say I would only be guessing because um, my last security manager was John Scott and he was head of security. So um, I vaguely remember maybe somebody from Fujitsu giving us a talk at one of our conferences um, and saying again that the computer system was reliable. Looking back at the wording of the first two sentences of paragraph 29 that we've just looked at, are you saying here that the assurances given to you about the complete reliability of the Horizon system had a direct impact on the decision making on whether or not to obtain ARQ data in cash shortfall cases? So I'm going to ask you to repeat that again, please. So we can reread them. The first two sentences at 29, you say, with regard to Fujitsu, I cannot recall if data would be requested in all cases of cash shortfalls, as we had been assured by Fujitsu that the Horizon system was completely reliable. So just that first sentence there, you seem to be linking the request for data and the decision as to whether that would happen to the assurance given by Fujitsu that the Horizon system was completely reliable. So I'm asking whether this had a direct impact, these assurances, on the decision making on whether or not to obtain ARQ data in cash shortfall cases. I would say it did because they were assuring us that this computer system was reliable. But assurances were all well and good until you're actually um, taking a prosecution. And there again, I have to say, this is where in Northern Ireland we asked for a statement from Fujitsu to say that the system was completely reliable. So yes, there was times, depending on the shortfall, depending on the investigation, um, that you may have not got that information from Fujitsu. Could we have on screen, please? I'm sorry, I interrupted. That's okay. It would depend on the case that you're dealing with. If we could have on screen, please, paragraph 71 of Ms. Winter's statement. That's page 37. In this paragraph, you address the relevance of a challenge to the integrity of the Horizon system in one case to other ongoing or future cases. Going over the page, please. Seven lines down. You say, I understand now that if Horizon recorded 
a different transaction to the one the SPM entered, then this could cause an error. But if there was a consistent pattern and none of the patterns showed that there was an underpayment and so the cash showed an excess, then it causes a concern. The concern and error did not prove a legal activity, but the SPM would need to provide an explanation. When you were an investigator, was there a presumption of dishonesty where the loss could not be explained? No. How would an agent or an employee of the post office be expected to explain or prove that they had not stolen or caused the loss? Was this particular paragraph that you've raised, this was um, in answer to the two qu uh, cases that I have been involved in? Um, well, this is under a heading of general in response to a question about the relevance of a challenge to the integrity of the horizon system in one case to other ongoing or future cases. You do make reference earlier on in this paragraph to the two cases which we'll come on to of Alan McLaughlin and Maureen McKelvey. But this sentence here seems to relate to your understanding now as to what was possible in terms of errors on the system. And I'm asking you if this reflects a presumption of dishonesty and an, expecta and an expectation that a sub postmaster would have to explain where there was a concern, as you put it. Yes, it would depend on what the um, discrepancies were. Yes, they would have to explain. Um, with regard to the Horizon system, what I know now, I most likely would have acted in a different way then. But yes, you're wanting to discuss, you're wanting to go down all avenues of concern and you would be asking the sub postmaster to explain if they can offer an explanation for any underpayment or excess. Um, I'm sorry, that's the only way I can sort of explain it to you. Do you recognise, looking at the wording you have used here, that this logic is the wrong way round. You are expecting someone who had experienced a shortfall to prove that they have not stolen the money or caused the loss, rather than the question being, could an actual loss be proved? No, I, I don't see that. I'm sorry. You say at paragraph 36 of your statement that you do not recall if the ARQ data was provided to the SPM as a matter of course. And you say this would be a decision made by the PPS. This would, of course, rely on that data having been provided to them, wouldn't it? Sorry, repeat the question, please. Well, we can go back and have a look at the um, paragraph, if you'd like. It's paragraph 36, page 20, please. So you're dealing here with the situation where ARQ data has been obtained from Fujitsu. You say, I do not recall if the ARQ data was provided to the SPM as a matter of course. This would be a decision made by the PPS. Yes. If, if the case had gone to um, the PPS, they would usually advise um, for that uh, data to be produced. But in a situation where you said you sometimes obtained ARQ data before that point in time, so yes. assuming you've obtained it in your investigation before you are referring the case to the PPS. In that situation, the PPS can only make a decision as to disclosure or not of the ARQ data if it's provided to them. That's right, isn't it? That's right. 
what did you typically include in your evidential report sent to the PSNI? There would have been, you include everything whenever you go to the police. You have, um, you would have notebook entries, you would have any evidence that you have regarding branch trading statements, cash declarations, um, all of your uh, investigative notes, um, you would have anything to do with the sub post office, how they had claimed any um, overages or shortages. You would have contacted the cash remittance people to see what money was delivered to the office. Um, you would have looked at calls to the help desk, calls to Horizon, um, you would have looked at past records, you would have spoken with contracts manager to see if there had been any issues with the office, you would have asked the retail line if they'd had any issues with the office, you would have looked at previous audit reports uh, to see how the office had been running. Um, so all that information would have been within your file to the police. Were there guidelines or a checklist to assist you in preparing the evidential report? Yes, there was guidelines to, uh, on how you had to prepare the evidential report so that it was easily understood by whoever was receiving it because post office was a complex business. How did you ensure that the PSNI and ultimately the PPS were provided with all available evidence, including any evidence relating to possible explanations which pointed away from the guilt of the suspect? I would have had telephone conversations with the, the police beforehand and then whenever I the, the file had to be hand delivered to the police and the, the inspector would have been through it with me, we would have discussed the whole case and then we would have looked at the evidence and he would have advised me, you need further evidence or you have sufficient evidence. If he had said you need further evidence, then I would have went got the further evidence and brought it to the police. Once the police were satisfied that there was sufficient evidence to put to the DPP or the PPS, then it went to the prosecution office. They then sat with me again and we would have had meetings with them and with their lawyers and discussed the case and then they would have advised me if there was sufficient evidence or if they required more evidence. If they did, then we got the evidence that they required and again, further meetings before any, was, any decision was made by the Public Prosecution Office. Where ARQ data was, was obtained as part of your investigation, was it provided as a matter of course to the PSNI and the PPS? Yes, because it was the police that said we need uh, evidence from the people that own the computer system that, that it is reliable. Um, so yes, if it was available at that time. Where it was provided to the PSNI or the PPS, were they provided with any information as to how to interpret the data? That have, would have been with, I would have said, the statement from Fujitsu. Could we have back on screen, please, paragraph 29 of Ms. Wiz, Ms. Winter's statement? That's page 17. Starting four lines down, you say, I did not get involved with Fujitsu until working in the business for a number of years when we were informed we had to produce an expert witness statement from Fujitsu in investigations. The decision to get expert reports was not made by me and I cannot recall who first advised me that I should get a report. I recall that there were protocols to follow should you require their assistance 
and horizon data would not always be requested if admissions had been made. I found the Fujitsu evidence statements hard to follow as they often had a lot of technical detail in them. When were you told that an expert witness statement from Fujitsu had to be produced in investigations? Can you recall? Um, I think it was a number of years within, and it was the, whenever I was preparing a prosecution file, and it was the police and I had a discussion about the computer system, and it was the police that said we need to have a statement from Fujitsu. And was this in relation to all investigations where Horizon data was being relied upon? If Horizon, if, if uh, Horizon data was being relied upon, yes. Did you understand what the purpose of such a report was? Yes. What was the purpose? Well, the purpose of this report from Fujitsu was for them to um, state that the Horizon computer system was reliable and was not at fault. You refer to protocols to follow should you require Fujitsu's assistance. Can you recall what those protocols were? Well, we did not have access to anyone in Fujitsu or allowed to have access. Um, I had to put my request through casework if I wanted anything from Fujitsu. And then, as far as I were, I'm aware, casework then dealt with that. About maybe nine years in, case, our casework team then got a Fujitsu liaison person. And that is the person that we would deal with then if we wanted anything from Fujitsu, if I wanted statements. I can't ever recall having direct contact with anyone in Fujitsu, maybe on an odd occasion whenever they were required to give me a statement and that hadn't been forthcoming, or to arrange for them to come to a um, court case. You refer to the Fujitsu statements as being hard to follow. Which parts of the statements did you find hard to follow? Can you recall? I remember there was um, there were statements that were they were quite lengthy. Now this is by recall, as I say, it's says quite a number of years ago. But I do remember looking at one of the statements, and there was one time there were statements came regarding the ARQs, and then I do believe there was another a further statement was required, more intricate into the system, and it was that one that I'm referring to, but. That's all I can remember, except I do remember um, it was a man that had made the statement and I think he had to come to one of my prosecution cases at court. Since the statements related to your investigations, did you ever seek clarification in respect of the bits which you found hard to follow? No. And why not? because it seemed to be the, the technical side, they were being reported as the expert of the computer. And you were more or less in the post office where we were, you, um, if you challenged anything, you, you didn't feel you could challenge anything, that's what I would say. Was there any particular individual or individuals who made that the case? No, I wouldn't say any particular individuals, but you just got the impression that um, if you started to challenge too much, um, it, it didn't go well. Can you recall the reason behind the police request for a statement from Fujitsu? 
in cases where Horizon data was relied upon? Well, as we discussed earlier, you need to disclose everything that you have. And it would stand to reason whenever you're investigating, you have to look at everything. And if there was any possibility that there was something wrong with the computer, that would need to be disclosed. And this is where I was happy working with the police and the Public Prosecution Service because they knew what you needed to make sure your case, you had um, investigated everything and disclosed everything that we had. We could not disclose that there was anything wrong with the computer because that was not what we had been told. And I understood why the police needed a statement to say that the computer was reliable. You say in paragraph 29 in the penultimate line that if admissions had been made, then Horizon data would not always be requested. Why was that? I'm not sure. Was that the assumption that there was no need to investigate further because an admission had been made? It, it may have been. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm not sure why. You refer at paragraph 37 of your statement to there being an expert witness from Fujitsu who provided a detailed witness statement when prosecution cases were progressing through the court. Um, is that the expert witness that you've just been referring to, i.e. the person who provided the statement required by the police? Yes. You seem to be referring to one particular person here. So you say you do not recall the name of this expert witness. Is that right? Yes. I mean, I would have dealt with um, Penny Thomas and Andy Dunks in Fujitsu whenever uh, information came through from casework. And as I say, on the odd occasion, I may have had an email from them. They produced ARQs and they would have given statements regarding the ARQs and the information on them. I do believe, and it's just my recall, for one of my cases, there was someone different came and it was a more technical statement, but I'm sorry, that's I just recall that, uh, but that's all I can say. You say at paragraph 41 of your statement um, that this requirement or this um, feature of an expert witness from Fujitsu was an exception to the general observation you make that investigations in Northern Ireland were conducted in the same ways as the rest of the United Kingdom. What was it that was different about the use of an expert witness from Fujitsu in Northern Irish cases from the way investigations were carried out in the rest of the UK? Sorry, could you just bring that paragraph up? Please, number of course, 41. It's page 21. So this is the paragraph where you deal with um, the, the process by which cases were investigated and prosecuted in Northern Ireland and how they differed from that, that process in England and Wales. And in the context of that, you say... Investigation cases were conducted in the same ways as the rest of the United Kingdom, except as mentioned in paragraph 37. If we can just pull up 37, please, it's page 20. Towards the bottom, please. This is the paragraph in which you refer to Andy Dunks and Penny Thomas's contacts in Fujitsu <coughs> and say there was also an expert witness from Fujitsu who provided a detailed witness statement when prosecution cases were progressing through the court in Northern Ireland. So that seems to be you describing that being the exception to investigations being conducted in the same way throughout the UK. I think that paragraph must be wrong then because that wouldn't have been 
I would have to go back to that previous paragraph to see what it was, but I think that's the wrong paragraph I've quoted. I see. Well, perhaps we can look at that over the lunch break and try to establish which, establish which the right paragraph is. I'd like to turn, please, to disclosure. You say at paragraph 11 of your statement that if a case progressed to court, the PSNI and PSO would assist with disclosure. Can you help with PSO? What did that stand for? That was the public, public office, public, I must have got it wrong, public office, it was the DPP. I always worked with the PSNI and the DPP or the PSO. You say you were the disclosure officer in the cases of Alan McLaughlin and Maureen McKelvey. Did you provide to the PSNI and or the PPS schedules of unused material? Yes. Did you provide them with disclosure reports? Yes. Were they documents that you completed as disclosure officer? Yes, they would have been. And what did you understand to be required to include on those documents? With disclosure, you disclosed everything that you had, everything that you were aware of, and I would have went through the disclosure with the police and for instance if you had notebook entries or if you just had scribbles on paper um, or evidence so we went through it with the police and I together and then they would have um, assisted with the disclosure. Was there any guidance or a checklist to ensure that once a case was proceeding to court, as opposed to at that earlier stage of you doing your evidential report, that all relevant information was sent to the PSNI and all the PPS? Um, you could always take, um, you could always look at information on the police and criminal evidence book or there would have been guidance um, that I maybe had from the police whenever we were first uh, arranging the memorandum of understanding. Who made decisions as to what material was disclosable in a prosecution? I think it ultimately would have been the director of public prosecutions because he would have received all the information from the police. Um, so that's who I would have said. The police forwarded all my file to the public prosecution along with a report because once my case went to the police, then they allocated a police officer. And I would have liaised with that police officer um, through through the, the, the system until it went to court. And then I would have met that police officer in court. If a case, case proceeded to court, would the evidence file be provided to the police uh, in full, in essence, your entire, fo your entire file on the case? My entire file was, was produced to the police because it could be quite extensive. And was the entire evidence file then provided to the defence in that prosecution? Can you recall? I wouldn't have had involvement with that. That would have then been with the uh, public prosecution office. I do know that for my file, I had just four copies. And the four copies were given to the police for them to distribute wherever they had to distribute. Was credence data obtained when gathering evidence and included in disclosure in cases against sub-postmasters, their staff and post office employees? 
yes, Cretans, if you had any Cretans um, data, you would disclose that, but you would have to uh, say that if you needed further disclosure for court, you needed to get an ARQ and a statement. And credence data only went back a limited period of time, didn't it? So if it hadn't, hadn't been obtained in the initial investigation, you wouldn't later be able to obtain it at the point of it going to court, would you? That's For right. But you'd have to be able to show that you'd looked at that information. So you're wanting to disclose all your material. I'd like to turn, please, to your involvement in the investigation and prosecution of Alan McLaughlin. To help with your memory of the case, Alan McLaughlin was the postmaster at Brookfield Branch, Belfast, between 1999 and 2001. He was prosecuted for 15 offences of false accounting contrary to Section 171A of the Theft Act, Northern Ireland, 1969. The offences were said to have occurred between the 13th of December 2000 and the 26th of July 2000. He initially contested the charges, but ultimately pleaded guilty on the 16th of February 2005 and was fined £700. He was also ordered to pay compensation in the sum of £1,300. And after conviction, he lost his business and was made bankrupt. You were the lead investigator in Mr McLaughlin's case, is that right? Yes. I'd like to start, please, with the interview you conducted with the assistance of Mr Thorpe, your line manager, on the 26th of July, 2001. Could we have on screen, please, AMCL 5032? It's page 94 of that document, please. We can see here that the interview was with Alan McLaughlin. You were the lead in lead interviewer and Frederick Leslie Thorpe, that's Mr Thorpe, was the second interviewer. Going please, and the date of the interview there, the 26th of July 2001. Going please to page 154 of this larger document. At this stage of the interview, you were putting to Mr. McLaughlin apparent discrepancies relating to pension payments shown by two documents, the computer ad list and the weekly summary sheet. Is that right? That's right. Do you agree that both of these were automated documents created by the Horizon system? It was the information, the person that was doing it would be checking off actual FOIs and keying in the information into the system. But these documents, the, the, the weekly summary sheet, and the computer ad list, those were things generated by the computer, is that right? The ad list was generated by the person entering the information 
and then the summary sheet was generated by the computer system. Okay. Towards the bottom of the page, you, said, you suggested that Mr. McLaughlin appeared to be balancing. So you say, and what made it interesting was that you always seem to be balancing. And then in response, he referred back to problems balancing when the Horizon system was first introduced. And we see by AM, three lines down. Yeah, it would start, we got dreadful problems balancing because of the problems with the capture system and the change over to Horizon. Things were very seesaw, very up and down, you know. Um, and then where did you, it was inaudible, and the response was it wasn't stable at all. <clears throat> Do you accept that this was a reference to significant problems balancing when Horizon was first introduced? Yes, I think Mr. McLaughlin was talking there at first about the capture system, which I think was there before Horizon. And then whenever Horizon system went in, um, he had problems with it. And that was two years ago from the interview. And so we can see that there. When did you go on to Horizon? in September of 99, and it wasn't say, stable. The balance were not stable at all. And that's the point that you then make. <laughs> that's two years ago. Going then to page 166, please. At 19.18, you ask this. It should. It doesn't explain how for last night, for instance, those three accounts were then put through the system. And Mr. McLaughlin replies, again, it's personal time, trying to get the balance on, trying to get it, you know, done by a certain time in a way. Because when I was first here, you know, and they were all over the place, we were eight o'clock, nine o'clock at night, yeah? So Mr. McLaughlin refers again to problems balancing, doesn't he? Yes, he does. I can understand. Going, please, to page 168. On this page, there is discussion of accounting errors made in branch, which Mr. McLaughlin was up front about and was discussing with you here. Is that right? Just take a moment to, to cast your eye down the page. Yes, uh-huh. And then over the page to 169, there is a discussion of shortages and what Mr. McLaughlin did in response to those shortages. Starting four lines down, where the, the pattern has been established and developed and evolved, that has certainly led to situation where, as you say, that accounts figure is not what it should have been. Mr. Thorpe, it seems, says, right, OK, so you've had some big shortage. You become, yeah, Mr. Thorpe, accounting errors. Mr. McLaughlin says, big, big shortages, yeah. Mr. Thorpe says, and for that reason, with a little bit of manipulation here, there's two inaudible, the surpluses to make good the shortages. And then Mr. McLaughlin says, well, it's a pattern, you know, and Mr. Thorpe, so that's that. Mr. McLaughlin, when people start, and that's what's happened, says Mr. Thorpe. Mr. McLaughlin, presumably, presume, yep, when people, when that happens, someone starts working to paranoid or whatever, and it works, yeah. And then Mr. McLaughlin at the bottom, you think, oh, fine, that's balancing and all the rest of it, but stores up, a bit stupid, really, it stores up problems, and you know it's not accurate accounting. Then at 
Then at, the pa at page 181, at the top, please. There's a question from Mr. Thorpe at the top, which is, which was the figure we just carried in your cash account? So why did you adjust it by £660? And Mr. McLaughlin says obviously to make the cash account show a reasonable balance. If that was the amount over, that must have been the adjustment. So Mr. McLaughlin accepts adjusting the figures to make the accounts balance, doesn't he, at this stage? Yes. <clears throat> and then going, please, to page 196. The allegation of false accounting is put to Mr. McLaughlin. So that is a false account, which is for you to submit this to the post office. And Mr. Thorpe says is actually a criminal offence. And Mr. McLaughlin says, sorry. Mr. Thorpe says, no, no, it's in this pattern, as you've said, has been going on regularly since perhaps February, January, February of the current year. Mr. McLaughlin says, yeah, and when I found out that, you know, what a procedure, what the postmasters were actually doing wasn't, because obviously we've had size, wildly variation um, cash accounts for a period, but whenever I found out what they would do would be, they would take the money, hold it, put it in, or keep it aside as according to what indication they were getting of where their, their cash account was going. I mean, that is what I, in my unclear way, um, it's always been, well, this is the practice and everyone's doing it, so it must be what you do to establish a continuum of acceptable accounts. So Mr. McLaughlin here was saying that this is what postmasters do to get it a, a continuum of acceptable accounts where there are wild variations. Would you accept that that's what he's saying? Yes. Then going please to page 202. <coughs> the second line down, you ask this. And you were aware that this was a criminal offence because it was falsing, falsifying accounts. And Mr. McLaughlin says, I wasn't that. I never thought about that or and put it in those terms at all. No, I wasn't as aware of that. I wasn't as aware of that. And you say you were aware it was wrong to do that. Mr. McLaughlin sighs. I was aware, aware that um, what I thought was, if not unaccepted, but a common practice to keep reasonable accounts was in danger of carrying a pattern which could not be understood or explained in terms of the original motivation for it. And you say, so you were, were you aware that you were falsifying your accounts? Mr. McLaughlin says, not. I wouldn't have set out to do that in that form or, or, or with that attention or plan, but as it were, that by allowing this kind of pattern to go on, the, the final accounting probably would not be completely accurate. And you say, and the reason you've been falsifying the accounts was because of shortages. And Mr. McLaughlin, any overages which resulted from those cash accounts were used for any shortages, which resulted because we had a lot of problems with staff at a particular point, which timing of which um, coincides with this, this pattern. I had a lot of problems with um, figures in the office. These were two staff, they were both um, dismissed. And you say, and I just want to clarify with you, did you keep a record anywhere of the discrepancies that you were making? Mr. McLaughlin, not that I know. So Mr. McLaughlin was denying any criminality in his interview, wasn't he? He was. And he gave a number of possible reasons in interview for discrepancies arising including accounting errors. 
but he also clearly raised balancing issues caused by the horizon system, didn't he? Looking at those sections we've just been through. No, I'm not sure about that. Why do you think not? Just looking at those sections is really just looking at that part of the interview. It's not telling the whole picture. We will come on in due course to the question of whether data was requested from Fujitsu after Mr. McLaughlin's interview. But in terms of other inquiries, did you make any inquiries at the time of any colleagues or seniors as to whether other postmasters were experiencing or had experienced balancing difficulties because of the Horizon system? No, because at that time, I think that was in 2001, um, there had never been any question of computer problems within the Horizon system. But just taking that first example, going back to when Horizon first came in in Mr. McLaughlin's branch, and he was saying balancing was all over the place, did that not cause you any concern, even if you thought it wasn't of particular rele relevance for your case two years later? No, because it was two years down the road, and during the interview, I think he did say that he got to do the balancing okay after a while, that that was at the beginning. I think he said the balancing was okay. But also, I do not know or recall if the information would have been available at that time because it was 2001. I wasn't aware of it at that time, of information being available from Fujitsu. Well, just staying on the point I asked you about in terms of inquiries of colleagues or seniors, someone had told you that after Horizon was introduced, balancing was all over the place. It wasn't stable. Was that something you thought important enough to discuss with other colleagues? As it had been two years ago, um, I'm not sure, I can't recall, but I do know I would have been looking at audit reports uh, and information from his retail line manager who would have been visiting the office to see if there had been any reports. I would have been looking at um, if there was any cold uh, logs available. I would have been asking more general knowledge from the people coming into the office. Um, I would have been asking them, is there any problem with this, with this particular office? Okay, but setting aside Mr. McLaughlin's case for a second, was it not a concern that the system was capable of causing balancing problems, regardless of whether they were operating in this case? Yes, it was a concern. So did you say that it was a concern to anyone else? It would have been sort of... I don't know if I actually would have put it out that it was a concern, because we were being told there was no concerns with the computer system. We did know, um, I wasn't on the investigation at the time of, of Horizon going in, but we had heard that there was trial periods where there was some glitches, as they would put, but that that had all been ironed out and sorted out. Also, maybe um, it could have been the, the person operating the system. So no, I don't think I would have raised many concerns because of what I had been told by senior management regarding Fujitsu. Given what Mr. McLaughlin had told you about balancing issues, not just at the beginning, but the other references he made to balancing issues more broadly, did you think to contact the helpline to see whether Mr. McLaughlin had raised any issues about the system in the past? We would have come to, I would have contacted the helpline. I would have contacted, I would have spoke actually with the casework management team and asked them for points of contact to see any information on uh, this particular post office.
Could we have on screen, please, page 26 of Ms. Winter's statement? The paragraph at the top of page 26. Is, this is a continuation of paragraph 50 from the previous page. And in the last six lines here, you say this. So this is in the reference of uh, the, the line before re referring to the interview with Mr. McLaughlin. You say he, well, actually, let's read that, that whole section together. You say, during the interview with Mr. McLaughlin, he mentioned having difficulty in processing certain documents, which, he un which I understood were inputting errors. And you say he also stated he had had counter losses and staff dishonesty. But as I had always been assured, there wasn't any problem with the Horizon system with regard to cash discrepancies. I did not consider the counter losses to be attributed to the Horizon system. I do not recall Mr. McLaughlin suggesting any direct issue with Horizon that would cause cash discrepancies or suggesting there was some error which could be attributed to Horizon. You may not recall it, but having looked at the interview transcript, would you agree that Mr. McLaughlin had raised having had problems balancing? because of the operation of the Horizon system in his interview. Whenever I read through the tape transcript again, Mr. McLaughlin kept referring to a system. And I believe it was the system that he was using to do his pension foils and not the system as in the Horizon computer system. You appear to be saying here that because of the assurances you had been given that Horizon was completely reliable, you concluded that the counter losses raised by Mr. McLaughlin were not attributable to Horizon. Is that right? No. What I'm saying is whenever I was discussing with Mr. McLaughlin during interview, he was referring to a system that he used for his pension foils, and he classed it as the system. So sometimes whenever you're reading through the tape transcript, you are thinking that the system he is talking about is the Horizon computer system, whereas it was the system that he was using with the help of an ex-sub-postmaster to process the paid pension foils. Well, what you say here is he had also stated he had counter losses and staff dishonesty, but as I had always been assured there wasn't any problem with the Horizon system with regard to cash discrepancies, I did not consider the counter losses to be attributed to the Horizon system. That, that's what you're saying here, isn't it? Yes, that's right. I didn't consider the counter losses to be attributed to the Horizon system. Um, and you're this... saying here, forgive me, that this was because you were assured there wasn't any problem with the Horizon system? Yes. OK. Sir, it, it is one o'clock. Is that a convenient moment to take lunch? Sir, you're on mute. Yes, <laughs> if we can come back at two o'clock then, sir. Thank you. <laughs>